Okay, uh, welcome back to the, this afternoon session. Uh, we'll have now, the, uh, for the first time in the series of this conference, uh, uh, what we have uh, called the Young Economist Session. And let me say that we are really proud to have in, in, uh, <clears throat> included this session in the program because uh, we had a sense, talking with other uh, members of the organizing committee, that probably uh, after the pandemic especially, the space for uh, voicing uh, research from uh, uh, young economists was restrained by the fact that uh, hybrid participation in events was favoring more and more established economists uh, rather than, uh, <laughs> than young economists. And then we said, well, why don't we, together with the usual uh, <coughs> um, uh, program that, uh, as you have seen, as we have all seen uh, during the last two days, uh, as many established economists, uh, we also had uh, uh, the idea to have, for the first time, uh, a young economist session with a call for paper. Uh, we received uh, uh, around 100 applications, so uh, many uh, applications. We had select only three, um, <clears throat> and I'm happy that uh, uh, the three uh, young economists of this year are uh, uh, on stage with me. Um, the first is Anastasia Antonova from Ex Marcel School of Economics, uh, Stefano Pica from Banco Vitali and uh, Fabian uh, Seidich from uh, Berlin School of Economics. So um, <clears throat> the rule of the game will be that uh, they will uh, alternate on stage, they'll present their research. Um, each of them has allotted a, a time of 30 minutes, 20 minutes, the presentation and 10 minutes for general discussions where I collect the questions. So uh, I'll start with, uh, please, with uh, Anastasia. Yeah, can I have my slides on, please? Yeah, okay, great. So, uh, so I'll start. So uh, the topic of my presentation is uh, state-dependent pricing and cost push inflation in a production network economy. Uh, so understanding whether the observed inflation is demand inflation or cost push inflation is very important for monetary policy. And if we look at the standard New Keynesian Phillips curve, uh, we see that it exactly gives us uh, the decomposition of inflation into demand uh, term, expectations term, and a cost push effect. But the big question is where does this cost push effect comes from? And one answer to this question would be that the cost push effect is the result of sector specific shocks. So think about oil uh, or energy shocks, for example. Uh, and generally speaking, if we take a multi-sector New Keynesian model, uh, the cost push effect is a function of three objects in this model. So first, uh, the sector-specific shocks, then uh, there is a production structure of the economy, and finally, it is a sector-specific price rigidity. And in this project, I will focus on this sector-specific price rigidity. So uh, broadly speaking, there are two types of price rigidity, two types of pricing models. So first are so-called non-state dependent pricing models. And here the most prominent example is our Calvo model. And under non-state dependent pricing, price rigidity that is fixed, it does not change. Uh, and then there is another pricing framework, which is a state dependent pricing uh, models. And uh, uh, the, the most uh, famous example here would be a menu cost model. And under state-dependent pricing, price rigidity may change depending on the size of the shocks that hit the economy. And if we take the existing literature that looks into a cost push effect in uh, multi-sectoral New Keynesian models, uh, we will see that this literature largely relies on non-state-dependent pricing. But at the same time, state-dependent pricing, first, is, first it is intuitively, uh, it is a more intuitive framework, and second, it is uh, confirmed empirically by numerous studies. So in this project, what I do, I look at how state-dependent pricing shapes cost push effect in a multi-sectoral uh, New Keynesian economy with a production network. 
so to do so, I use a multi-sectoral Newcanian model with the input-output network. And the distinctive feature of my model is that price rigidity is state dependent. And I use this model uh, to do a three-step analysis. First, I look into the theoretical role of state dependence. Uh, then I use the model to empirically estimate the degree of state dependence for each sector of the US economy. And finally, I look at the quantitative role of this state dependence in shaping cost push effect in the US. So the, the main results are as follows. First, uh, state dependent pricing is important theoretically. It uh, may uh, lead to amplification or deamplification of cost push effect compared to a non-state dependent pricing model. Uh, but moreover, it can also lead to a sign reversal of cost push effect. Uh, then, empirically, I find that the majority of sectors in the U.S. economy have some statistically significant degree of state dependence uh, in their pricing. And finally, I show that state dependence is quantitatively important for the U.S. and that uh, the, um, uh, the implications of state dependence are different uh, during different uh, type of crisis. So let me skip the literature. So to start with, I will give you some idea of how I introduce uh, state dependence into this uh, new Keynesian production network model, while at the same time uh, keeping the analytical tractability of the model. So uh, to model state dependent pricing, we need to ask a question, what is a good state variable uh, in this economy, given that we have many sectors? And to define uh, a good state variable, uh, what I do, I look uh, into the expression for the vector of sector-specific marginal cost in the model. And this sector-specific marginal cost, uh, they are a function of sector-specific productivities and sector-specific markups. Uh, so uh, productivities in the model, uh, these are total factor productivities in each sector and they are assumed to be exogenous. So given this expression for marginal cost, uh, I uh, define the relevant productivity state in each sector as a combination of sector specific productivities that affect the, uh, the marginal cost in this sector either directly if it's uh, the own productivity or indirectly through the input output network. And then, given this definition of uh, the relevant state variable for each sector, uh, what I do, I model uh, state-dependent price rigidity uh, by combining a famous sticky information framework with a heterogeneous uh, inattention framework. Uh, more specifically, I assume that firms uh, in a given sector uh, track fluctuations in their sector-relevant productivity state. And then I also assume that uh, firms have heterogeneous degree of inattention distributed across firms within a sector according to some sector specific distribution. And only those firms who have low enough uh, inattention compared to the current size of the relevant state fluctuation, only those firms update their information in any given period. And finally, those who update their information, they receive the full information about the economy. So what this uh, framework gives me is that sectoral price flexibility uh, is equal to the share of firms who update their information as you would have in a sticky information framework. And uh, in turn, this share depends on the change in a sector relevant productivity state. So next, since I want to uh, study the cost push effect, I need to define uh, formally what is the cost push effect. Uh, so to do so, uh, I derive the Phillips curve for consumer price inflation in the model. And as uh, a normal Phillips curve, it has a demand uh, component, expectations term, and cost push effect. So I'm interested in the cost push term of this Phillips curve. Uh, so uh, my uh, cost push effect here is expressed in terms of a vector of uh, uh, sectoral price gaps. So sectoral price gaps are just the differences between the efficient prices in each sector and uh, the true prices that uh, were uh, 
uh, in, uh, that were present in, in each sector in the previous period. So intuitively, th these sectoral price gaps, they capture the desirable degree of price adjustment in each sector. And besides the sector, uh, besides the sectoral price gaps, uh, cost push effect also depends on the details of production network and on sector specific price flexibilities, which are now uh, state dependent. So in this initial form, uh, the cost push effect is very difficult to analyze because, because of the presence of production network. So to facilitate the, the theoretical analysis, uh, what I do, I decompose uh, the cost push effect uh, into the two, component, uh, two components, the main component and the input-output component. So the idea behind this decomposition uh, uh, relies on the notion of the reset prices. So reset prices are prices chosen by those firms who decide to reset the price uh, in a given period. And the main component of uh, the cost push effect is the cost push effect that you would have uh, if all those who reset their prices would choose their new prices to be at their efficient level. And the input output component, it captures uh, the effect uh, of propagation of nominal rigidity through the production network and this propagation of nominal rigidity leads uh, to a real rigidity because now marginal costs are not their efficient level and uh, so the reset prices are different from the efficient uh, prices. So uh, main uh, effect or main component is very useful uh, for us uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, it gives a very clear intuition about the first order effect of state dependent pricing. Uh, on cost push inflation. And second, uh, I show in the paper that uh, this main effect is quantitatively much more important, at least in the US, than the input output effect. So uh, to understand why state dependence matters for uh, cost push inflation, let me give you a following three sector example. So, uh, so imagine that we have a three sector economy and in each sector we have uh, a relative price gaps. So sector one and sector two want to decrease their prices and sector three wants to increase uh, its price. And by construction, because these price gaps are relative, they, their sum is zero. Uh, now, consider uh, the case of non-state dependent pricing. So what does non-state dependent pricing mean? It means that uh, in each sector, price flexibility is assigned in advance and it does not change. Uh, so imagine that we have uh, sector one with fully flexible prices and sector two and sector three with fully rigid prices. So in this case, what happens is that uh, prices in sector one adjust while prices in sector uh, two and three do not adjust. And if we compute the main component of the cost push effect, uh, we will see that this main component is negative and this negativity is driven by the downward adjustment in sector one. Uh, now consider what happens if we have state-dependent pricing framework instead. So under state-dependent pricing, it should be the case that price flexibility adjusts to the size of the shock. In, in my example here, uh, the sector three is hit by the largest size of the shock, which is reflected in its uh, largest size of the price gap. This means that prices in sector three should become flexible. And in this case, uh, what we would have is that uh, prices in sector one and sector uh, two will remain rigid, while prices in sector three uh, become flexible. And uh, in terms of the main component of the cost push effect, what we would have is the positive cost push inflation driven by the upward adjustment in sector three. So uh, as you can see, depending on the pricing framework, uh, uh, we can have different sign of the cost push inflation. Uh, so let me give you another example of the importance of pricing framework. So this example is about the effect of commodity shocks. So imagine that we have uh, an economy where we have two commodities, oil and grain, uh, and we have two final uh, goods. Uh, one is oil intensive and another is grain intensive. And also imagine that we have a commodity shock. It is either oil shock or a grain shock. And uh, 
this economy has a very simple expression for the main component of cost push effect uh, uh, given uh, each of the shocks. So of course this uh, component depends on the shock itself, but also it depends on the difference between uh, price flexibilities in the two final good sectors. So now what happens if we have non-state dependent pricing? And the non-state dependent pricing, price flexibility in one of the sectors uh, uh, is always larger than the price flexibility in another sector. And without uh, the loss of generality, we can assume that uh, prices are more flexible in the oil intensive sector. And what happens uh, in this case is that if we have a negative oil shock, this will lead a, uh, to a positive uh, cost push effect. And if we have a negative negative grain shock, this will, have, uh, this will lead to a negative cost push effect. And this is very counterintuitive because when we think about the negative commodity shock, we, we expect that it will lead to a, a cost push inflation and not to cost push deflation. Uh, however, uh, state dependent pricing model actually remedies uh, this problem. So under state dependent pricing, if we have oil shock, uh, oil intensive industry becomes more flexible and if we have grain shock the grain intensive industry becomes more flexible and in both cases uh, both a negative oil shock and negative grain shock would, would lead to a positive cost push effect uh, in line with our basic intuition about the effect of a commodity shock. Uh, so next I'm interested in uh, whether this state-dependent price, pricing uh, exists empirically uh, in the US economy at a sectoral level. So to estimate empirically the state dependence, I impose a functional form on my sectoral price flexibility. And uh, uh, so the sectoral price flexibility is a sum of the average price flexibility and state-dependent component. So the average price flexibility, think of it as a Calvo parameter. It uh, can be different across sectors, but it is it doesn't change over time and the state dependent component captures how price flexibility adjusts to the changes in the size of the relevant productivity state fluctuation uh, and then I mm, so to estimate uh, the average price flexibility and state dependence parameter in each sector, what I do, I take the model and I derive the contemporaneous response of sectoral markups to sectoral productivity shocks in the model. And um, uh, this response, it contains exactly the information about uh, price flexibility. But the problem is uh, that I do not observe neither sectoral markups nor sectoral productivity shocks at a good enough disaggregation at, at a good enough frequency to do my estimation. So what I do, uh, I construct the model implied sectoral markups and sectoral productivity shocks from the data that I have. Uh, and this is the data on sectoral prices and wages that I observe in monthly frequency. Uh, and uh, I use the links, the, uh, the model links between prices and wages and markups and productivities. And this is how I estimate uh, my uh, parameters for average price flexibility and state dependence. So these are the estimates uh, I get. So these are the distribution of these two parameters across sectors. So on the left, this is the distribution of average price flexibilities. As you can see, it is quite heterogeneous. And here, one thing to notice is that uh, uh, the, those sectors related to commodities, they have higher uh, price flexibility on average, which is in line with uh, what the previous authors have found. But then on the right, we have the distribution of state dependence parameters, uh, parameter across sectors. So here what I do, I uh, push all the insignificant estimates to zero. And this gives us 70% uh, of sectors and sectors here are weighted by consumption share. Uh, so 70% of sectors have some statistically significant degree of state dependence. So next, to understand my estimates a little bit better, I look how they correlate with the volatility of my relevant productivity state that I defined before. So average price flexibilities correlate positively uh, with this relevant productivity state volatility, uh, meaning that the more volatile conditions are in a sector, the more flexible are prices in the sector uh, on average. Uh, but the state dependence parameter correlates negatively with uh, the state volatility, meaning that the less volatile are the conditions in a sector, uh, the more state dependent pricing is in this sector. 
So finally, uh, given that, that I've estimated this price flexibility framework uh, in each sector, what I do, I compute a uh, model implied monthly uh, cost push effect uh, for the US, uh, which is the blue line. And then I also compute a contrafactual cost push effect where I switch off the state dependent component of price flexibility. And this is the gray, gray line. And on this uh, plot, there are two historical periods of interest. So first period is the period after the Great Recession. So in uh, 2009, uh, you can see that both state-dependent model and non-state-dependent model predict uh, quite high uh, positive cost push effect. And state-dependent pricing here just played uh, an amplification role, basically. But if we look at the more recent period, starting, uh, starting from COVID crisis and then other events that followed, we can see that here, often it is the case that uh, state-dependent pricing reverses the sign of the cost push effect. So as you can see, depending uh, on the uh, type of the crisis, we can have different implications uh, for state dependent, for how state dependent pricing shapes cost push inflation. And a final remark I want to make about this graph is about the actual recent inflation in the US. So as you know, in 2021, 2022, there was an unprecedented uh, observed inflation in the US and the observed monthly inflation is plotted as a gray uh, line here. Uh, however, as you can see, neither state-dependent nor non-state-dependent pricing models do not uh, attribute this inflation to cost push effect. Uh, so a uh, state-dependent pricing model produces uh, a transitory cost push effect, a transitory positive cost push effect uh, around the supply chain uh, crisis problem, but then this uh, cost push effect fades away. This means that this recent persistent episode of inflation uh, may be attributed more to the demand inflation or to expectations uh, inflation than to the cost push inflation. So in conclusion, uh, so it is very important to understand how cost push inflation is shaped. And uh, in this paper, uh, I show that uh, a pricing framework is really important when we are trying to compute aggregate cost push effect in a multi-sectoral uh, models. And it's important not only theoretically, but also quantitatively, at least for the US. Uh, so thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Anastasia. Maybe we can uh, directly open the floor for questions. Any question? Yeah. Wolfgang? Yeah, Wolfgang Lemke, one of the organizers. Um, just one quick question. So if you would run on the same sample a standard model, plain vanilla, um, and identify cost push shocks versus demand shocks, how would that differ from your sophisticated model where you would consider state-dependent pricing? Or put differently, if your world would be the DGP, the data generating process, how would like standard simple models perform in that type of environment? Other questions, Lorenzo? Thank you, no, very, very interesting paper. Uh, I was wondering on this um, you know, uh, cross-sectional differences in the state dependence across sectors, how much that is actually a manifestation of the fact that uh, in the end, so the, the pricing at the sectoral level, we still have an aspect of uh, you know, dyadic uh, uh, dependence no, between one sector and the other, just as these sectors are operating in a production network. No? So I would expect and the flexibility of, a, of uh, the prices in a given sector to actually reflect the position of that sector inside the network. So I was wondering how much of the differences you actually uncover are just, uh, no, the, the, uh, it's not intimately a higher flexibility or rigidity of a given sector, but just of the position of the sector in the network. Thanks. Giacomo? Just a quick one. I was wondering whether um, there is also some implication for 
somehow the effectiveness of monetary policy in, uh, in this context is also state dependence. I mean, if I step back and I look at the standard New Keynesian Phillips curve, the frequency of price adjustment has something to do with the slope of the Phillips curve, meaning uh, that if it's steeper, then the central bank is kind of more effective in stabilizing inflation. It, do we have something like along this line here? And David, first of all. Thank you. This is a very interesting paper. Congratulations. Mm, the question that I have is, uh, um, can you use some information about the frequency of price changes to identify the difference between productivity and markups component? It's unclear. You didn't have time to explain. But how do you actually identify what's changing markup and what is the contribution of productivity using the data that you have? Because my understanding is that you're using only data on prices, right? And wages, yes, thanks. Okay, I'll be, go back to you. Um, yeah, so first, uh, your question about uh, the simpler model, right? Uh, so, uh, to my view, there are uh, like two types of simplicity. So, one model would be like one sector. A new Keynesian model, and the other type of simplicity would be j just a network model, but, but with uh, but with Calvo uh, parameters. Uh, so that would be a good exercise to compare um, to to compare that model uh, with what my model gives. Uh, I didn't do that, but uh, so I tried to model the price uh, rigidity so that it has like two components and one of them can be interpreted as calvo so uh, when i shut down the state dependent component of price rigidity uh, i interpret this this model as what the calvo model with heterogeneous degrees of price rigidity across sectors would give me so uh, so um, so yeah if if this answers uh, your question uh, so yeah, uh, then uh, about your question about the uh, cross-sectional uh, differences and what what actually do I capture with these different price flexibilities? Yeah, that, that's that's a very good question. Uh, so uh, what I think is that uh, uh, so the uh, even the average price flexibility it reflects the position uh, on the network and how exposed you are to to volatility in different sectors uh, to which you are connected uh, so but um, so i uh, i allowed for heter for ex ante heterogeneity in price flexibilities just uh, so that uh, my model is comparable to the calvo model with heterogeneous price flexibilities uh, the more advanced or uh, proper way to do that would be to have a full fledged menu cost model where ex ante Every, everybody has the same pricing framework and then exposed because they are um, because they face different and um, they are in different in their network and they face different volatility exposed they will uh, have different price flexibilities but uh, so my design uh, is just to compare with the standard calvo model um, uh, yes if this answers your question and yeah about the effectiveness of monetary policy uh, yeah this is a very good question so uh, i thought so uh, in because uh, because price flexibilities are time varying in my model and the slope of the phillips curve uh, d it depends on these price flexibilities. Uh, in my model, indeed, the slope of the Phillips curve is time varying as well. Uh, but so, and I saw that it might have some implications for uh, for for the effectiveness of monetary policy. But empirically, when I compute this uh, uh, this slope, it's it's almost constant. So I, I I don't find any quantitatively important results on the slope, even though. This is a theoretical possi possibility, um, uh, and yes, uh, about the uh, identification of uh, 
so how do I disentangle between sectoral productivities and sectoral markups? So I have the data on uh, prices, on sectoral prices and sectoral wages. So uh, labor in the model is sector specific, and so in each sector, wage is different. And then in the model, the expression that they have is that wages, they are uh, a function of some aggregates and then of a sector specific markups. Uh, so basically, and, and prices are a function of uh, productivities and markups. So because I have both prices and wages and in one, so in the relationship between wages and markups, there are no productivities and between uh, prices uh, and productivities and markups, there are productivities that allows me to disentangle this. Um, uh, yeah, so it it's, it's, would be easier to show with equations, uh, yeah. uh, but sectoral wages are a key uh, here. Yeah, uh, th thanks a lot for, for your questions. Okay, thanks a lot again, and uh, now we move to Stefano. Please, Stefano. We go. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, into the program. Um, great conference. Um, today I'm going to be talking about um, housing markets and uh, monetary policy in the euro uh, area. And the usual disclaimer applies. So um, the question I ask in the paper is. Um, well, how do housing and mortgage markets uh, affect the monetary transmission mechanism uh, in the euro area? Um, now, we know that monetary policy has heterogeneous effects across countries in the euro area. What do we mean by that? Is that you know, just some countries respond more strongly uh, than others in terms of aggregate consumption, for example, and a bunch of other uh, variables. Now, the, um, what I do in this paper is I investigate the role of some housing and mortgage market uh, characteristics into this heterogeneous transmission mechanism of, of monetary policy. And in particular, I'm going to be focusing on adjustable rate mortgage shares, um, ARM shares, and home ownership rates, um, HOR. Um, now, usually, uh, since there are non-euro area people in, the, uh, in, uh, in here, like usually click on the hyperlinks, but will be difficult here. So there are big heterogeneities of adjustable rate mortgage shares and home ownership rates across countries. Like in terms of adjustable rate mortgage shares, some countries go from you know, 10% relative to fixed rate uh, all the way up to 90% if we think about Spain. Uh, and the same for home ownership rates. Like there are huge differences across countries. And so in this paper, that's what I'm, I'm going to be um, essentially leveraging. Um, and um, Empirically, I've shown that there are strong correlations between the local impact of monetary policy, so how much is monetary policy effective in each given country, and the adjustable rate mortgage shares and home ownership rates in those specific uh, countries. Um, and then I'm going to um, set up a, a new Keynesian model. I'm going to be showing you um, no equation today, but just you know, some intuitions of the model uh, of a currency union to think about the euro area featuring long-term mortgages um, and home ownership rates. Um, and the idea here is that through the lenses of the structural uh, model, I'm going to be able to separately quantify the contribution of adjustable rate mortgage shares and home ownership rates to uh, aggregate consumption responses to, to monetary policy. And then I also, um, you know, the model is going to be able to give me the possibility to do some counterfactual. So I'm going to be asking, well, what, uh, what's the effect of the, on the monetary transmission mechanism uh, of a unified mortgage market? And I'm going to be specific uh, what I mean by that. Uh, in the paper, I also look at uh, the consequences of introducing house prices into the euro area price index. It's something that was discussed in the strategy review, but I'm not going to be able to do this on time today. Okay, so let me just, uh, just so we're all on board, just um, I'm going to be uh, giving you some preview of findings. Uh, in the paper I show the countries that have stronger empirical responses in terms of consumption, price to rent ratios, uh, the volume of mortgage issuance and mortgage interest rates are actually those countries that have higher adjustable rate mortgage shares and higher home ownership rates. 
However, I also show that empirically you see that it just so happens that counties that have higher adjustable rate mortgage shares and higher ownership rates are actually on average the, the same county. So there's sort of an identification problem. That's why I'm going to be moving to the structural model. And I'm going to be having two countries there and they are calibrated to Spain and the Euro area. Spain is sort of a it's on, on one side of the spectrum in terms of these characteristics of the housing market, a lot of adjustable rate mortgage shares and higher ownership rate, and the euro area, which is sort of the average, right? So um, I calibrate the model to, the, to, the, uh, to, to these key institutions, and I show that the consumption is in Spain actually increases um, more than twice as much as in the euro area, and this is in line with the data. Then I show in the paper how, you know, how adjustable rate mortgage shares and home ownership rate actually interact. Uh, to amplify the effects of monetary policy. Uh, there's, you know, countries with high adjustable rate mortgage shares, well, that means that there's more pass-through from the policy rate to the mortgage interest rates, and that's a pure cash flow effect on, on borrowers, essentially on mortgaged homeowners. Um, but then there's also higher home ownership rates, meaning uh, on average higher uh, fraction of mortgaged homeowners in any given country, and that's more of a level effect, uh, sort of this pass-through uh, as effect of m on many more people. So that's sort of the mechanism why we see what we see. Um, and then, uh, you know, I have this counterfactual on the euro area wide mortgage market uh, the, the decreases the heterogeneous effects of monetary policy uh, if, if, you know, countries have a, a more similar fraction of, of contracts that are adjustable relative to fixed rate. And that goes through the pass through of the policy. And I'm not going to be talking about uh, this part on, on house prices in the euro era price uh, index. Okay, I'm going to skip the lit review in the interest of time, but today in this very short presentation, I'm just going to be giving you some uh, empirical motivation, um, some impulse response functions, uh, monetary policy shocks, and then I'm going to be just highlighting some uh, insights from the currency union New Keynesian model, give you some results, and then I'm going to uh, conclude. So what's the empirical specification I have in the paper right now is a Jordan 2005 sort of uh, standard uh, local projection specification uh, for 11 euro area countries. And for each given country, I'm going to be running the, 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 the local projection where on the left hand side, you have the variable Y, which is say variable of interest, uh, say aggregate consumption or average mortgage interest rates or newly issued mortgages or house prices. Then you have um, the Epsilon MP, that's the monetary policy shock. I'm going to be using some proxy from surprises from the database on uh, Altavilla et al. here. Um, and, uh, you know, these monetary policy sh um, surprises are the, I'm going to be using the two-year overnight interest swaps around policy analysis. So those are from my frequency identification. Um, and obviously the quantity of interest here is the beta uh, HC. So that's going to tell you essentially the empirical impulse response, okay, for any given horizon, for any given country, what's the percentage change, uh, percentage point change um, to, uh, of, of the variable Y to one standard deviation uh, expansionary monetary policy shock. Then there are some controls, and what I'm going to be doing here is looking at this impulse response function, looking at the peaks or the troughs, and that's, gonna, uh, that's how I define, you know, the effectiveness of monetary policy. Um, and then I'm going to be correlating those with adjustable rate mortgage shares and home ownership rate. So uh, this is just one of the results. Uh, I show you today the, um, the results on mortgage interest rates. So you have on the y-axis the response uh, uh, of the mortgage, uh, the average mortgage interest rate to the monetary policy shock across the different countries. And you see here that you know to the same monetary policy shock. Um, some countries just respond much more to, than others. So you see some countries like Germany or Netherlands barely respond, while some others like uh, Italy or uh, Ireland and so on just respond much more. And so essentially what I'm going to be doing next is looking at the, in this specific case, the troughs, so the minimum points of these impulse response functions. Those are going to help me define the effectiveness of monetary policy in terms of the average mortgage interest rate, correlating those with housing and mortgage market characteristics. And so here is the um, uh, uh, here I'm taking the troughs from the previous graphs. I'm going to be plotting them on the y-axis, and then against, on the x-axis, different characteristics of the housing and mortgage markets. So here, for example, in terms of the share of adjustable rate mortgages, okay, the very first graph, 
You see here that on average, countries that are more on the right of the graph, so countries that have higher share or adjustable rate mortgages, essentially as those countries that respond the most in terms of um, average mortgage interest rate to uh, monetary policy shock. And this is going to be true also for you know, different measures of ownership rates, a fraction of outright homeowners, and fraction of, of homeowners with mortgages. Um, that's not only true for the mortgage interest rate, if, 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 even if we look at the volume of newly issued mortgages, then again you see that this is an expansionary monetary policy shock, so these countries are going up instead. And so you see that the countries that respond the most are again those with the higher levels of this housing and mortgage market characteristics, and this is going to be true to, for price to rent ratios and aggregate consumption. Okay, so I, I told you, I showed you that you know, some, this, there are some correlations between monetary policy responses and uh, the characteristic of the housing markets that, that, I, that I'm interested in. But again, there's this sort of identification problem I discussed a little bit in the intro, which is you know, some countries, um, so the countries that have higher adjustable rate mortgage shares, if you look at the, the first graph, for example, are actually those that have uh, higher home ownership rates as well. So if you think about Spain, that is like a 90% adjustable rate mortgage shares as of 2015. Um, and you know, it also has a, a very high home ownership rate of around 80%. So these are very, so there are these correlations across countries. Um, and that's why I'm going to be switching to a structural model to kind of tease out what are the, um, where are the effects that we, we, we looked at in the correlation with monetary policy coming from, whether they are coming from adjustable mortgage shares or home ownership rates, and what's the intuition behind. Um, so I'm going to be very brief on the model because it's a very big uh, model with a lot of equations, but I'm going to be just giving you uh, the structure, some intuition. The structure of the model is it's a currency union, new Keynesian model, and there's going to be you know, rich household balance sheets. Okay, so uh, there's going to be two countries, uh, home and foreign, so this is the style of this international finance li literature, and I follow Faya Manacelli in 2008, in most of it, so there are these two countries, home and foreign, one is small, uh, open economy relative to the other, so in this case, it's going to be, I will calibrate them to Spain and the Euro area. And then on, on top of this structure, on international finance type of structure, I'm going to be, um, you know, um, uh, um, enrich uh, the model with some details of the housing and mortgage markets a la Green Bull 2018. Essentially, so there's going to be, um, you know, there's going to be homeowners and outright homeowners and uh, uh, mortgaged uh, homeowners and, and renters. Um, and the idea here is that then I can compare, I can move around the structure of the housing market and I can compare the responses to a common monetary policy shock when moving around these characteristics of the housing market. And the first um, characteristic that I add on top of this uh, structure uh, is uh, uh, um, adjustable rate mortgage shares and fixed uh, rate mortgages. And this I, you know, take a stand here, these are essentially exogenous in my model, so there's a parameter governing how much a country, uh, how much adjustable rate mortgages there are in a country relative to the fixed rate. You know, there are some explanations in the paper, some examples that show actually how, you know, in some countries actually these were uh, like uh, institutions be behind these characteristics and not necessarily uh, endogenous. Uh, and there's an example for, for Spain there. Um, and the second characteristic I include, because I'm interested in the home ownership rate, is I introduce this endogenous home ownership rate. Home ownership rate does not need to be endogenous, actually, in this model, it can be exogenous. But, you know, um, I have it as endogenous so that we can draw consequences also on the movement over the business cycle for home ownership rates. Um, and the idea is that essentially some countries, um, on average, uh, borrowers are happier than others to, to live in a house, and so there are these shocks each period which aggregate out so that you, know, you have endogenous home ownership rate that moves with the business cycle. And uh, you know, the differences in ownership utility across countries basically are reflecting on a bunch of institutions which I know model explicitly, such as you know, rental market quality, subsidies, um, and, and so the rental market quality, for instance, in Spain is not great, and subsidies, there are a lot in, in Germany, and, and so on. So those are some reduced form for, uh, for all those things. Um, okay, let's go to one of the main results, which is essentially following a, a monetary policy shock in the, in the model. Um, Spain is essentially more responsive uh, relative to the euro area. And so this is, 
like uh, uh, um, a very persistent 1% fall in the nominal rate. So together with the nominal rate, obviously the adjustable rate mortgage uh, rate is, is essentially the same in the model fall. And, and that's a, a movement in the interest rate in the euro area, but you see uh, Spain is an, an open economy, so essentially it, it's gonna inherit the same, because we are in a currency unit, the same interest rate. And then you see that um, essentially following this uh, interest rate uh, shock, um, then the, uh, the average mortgage interest rate in Spain respond more. And this is also what I was showing empirically. And this is um, really uh, just due to the fact that there is a higher pass through from policy rate to the mortgage interest rate. It's mostly gonna be due to the fact that in Spain there are a lot of adjustable rate mortgages. In the paper I do uh, the composition that shows how much of this that we see here is due to adjustable rate mortgages relative to ownership rates. I don't have time today, but you see that this is true for many other variables that Spain respond more. Spain respond more in terms of uh, newly issued mortgages, in terms of uh, price to rent ratios, and that's because there are many m bigger movements in home ownership rates, so many more uh, movements across people that change their tenure status, so there's bigger movements in the price, house prices. Uh, and, and rent, um, and then there's a stronger um, response also to, in terms of aggregate consumption, okay? This is merely based on these differences in the housing uh, market. That's where the different calibration across countries come from. Okay, so then now, since I've set up this, this, this big model where I can think about you know, differences in the um, housing and mortgage markets in transmission mechanism and monetary policy, um, what I do in one of the two counterfactuals I study in the paper is thinking a little bit more of a euro area wide mortgage market. There's a lot of dis discussion on the benefit or, of a European uh, fiscal uh, union. Um, very limited as of now, but mortgage markets are really uh, one of the few types of markets that are really different across countries. Okay, there's just institutional differences. Um, for example, you will never get a mortgage in one country in Germany just to buy a house in Italy, and uh, your German bank will tell you, look, go get it in, in Italy. So it's just very different and, and banks don't do cross um, uh, issuance of, of mortgages. Um, so very different institutions. And so what I imagine in this model is that in a euro area wide mortgage market, at least this financial regulation becomes more similar. And what I mean by that is that essentially the, uh, the countries are gonna issue mortgage contracts that are in a more similar proportion between adjustable and fixed rate. And so I eliminate this big heterogeneity across countries, in this, in this case across Spain and the Euro area, in terms of the share of adjustable rate mortgages. In particular, I consider two additional economy. Uh, yes, when, when in Spain, the adjustable rate mortgage share gets decreased from 90%, which is a very big uh, fraction as, as of now, to 70%. Uh, and then it, it goes shifted in the second, in a second exercise, I shift the, the, the adjustable rate mortgage share of Spain to 47%. So essentially the same as the Euro area level. Okay, so there are these intermediate cases where still the countries are very different in terms of the ownership rates, how many people own, own a house and how many people on a, on a mortgage, but at least now in this calibration, this exercise, they're gonna uh, have a very similar adjustable rate mortgage shares. And then this is going to be the results on top of the, the, the figures that, that I had before. So essentially um, in, in, in red, you still have Spain and in blue, you still have the Euro area, but now there's going to be some intermediate cases. And, and then you see that essentially with these intermediate cases, with countries being more similar in terms of the fraction of adjustable rate mortgage shares, um, then uh, essentially the heterogeneity gets reduced across the Euro area. Um, consumption gets reduced by 40%. The difference of consumption responses in Spain and the Euro area gets reduced by 40% in the first exercise and by most, almost all of it in, in the second exercise of same adjustable rate mortgage shares across countries. Um, there is a trade-off, however, because Yes, we're reducing heterogeneity, but of course there's also a redistribution of resources. In Spain, you know, there's a different distribution of marginal propensity to consumes because there are more mortgaged homeowners who are, um, you know, constrained households in this model. And so, uh, you know, the loss during an expansion of the economy, the loss of, of resources uh, for, for these borrowers uh, is very demanding in terms of borrowing welfare. And, and it's here essentially the savers who are those that are issuing these contracts are uh, benefiting from this expansion of the economy of, of, um, of reducing the interest rates. 
Um, so I was doing, in the next version of the paper, I'm going to switch. I'm going to be doing increases in interest rate, which is a bit more um, uh, similar to what's happening nowadays. OK, so uh, in conclusion, um, uh, I showed you some correlations between the local impact of monetary policy, how much is monetary policy effective across different countries, and some institutional aspects of, of those countries, especially in terms of housing and mortgage markets. In a calibrated currency union new Keynesian model, I showed that essentially uh, given some characteristic difference in, in terms of housing and mortgage markets, consumption responses in, in Spain is more than twice as much as in the euro area. Um, and this is similar to the data. And then a euro area wide mortgage market, when we think about you know, having more similar contracts that are issued across countries, uh, in, in this specific example in Spain, but this can be generalized to any country in the euro area, uh, is actually effective in reducing this heterogeneous transmission of monetary policy, although uh, there's going to be some, some trade-off in terms of you know um, the distribution of resources and then um, you know in the paper uh, if you're interested you, you can have a look at it I show that including house prices into the euro area price index is going to lead a trade-off between output which is going to be more stabilized but then a, a loss of, of stabilization in terms of goods and services um, inflation um, thank you so much for, for listening We can open the floor now for questions on uh, the paper. <clears throat> yeah, Lorenzo and then Kathleen. Uh, thank you, Stefano. No. Interesting paper as well. Um, I, I was wondering whether um, you have tried to see also the state dependence of this adjustable rate uh, mortgages, given that we, we did observe no, that uh, the shares uh, changed abruptly depending on the stance of monetary policy and the duration also of the stimulus. So I wonder how much of that plays into uh, your story. Thank you. Catherine? Yeah. Thank you for, for the nice presentation. So I was a little bit surprised to see that you choose to model Spain uh, as a small open economy and a large foreign economy. And I was wondering, so I see why you are doing that. Uh, but I was wondering when you would say the small open economy is, say, the Netherlands, if you can also match uh, the data and your impulse responses. Okay. Giacomo? Uh, quick one. By the way, d did you try also with a QE shocks, namely a shock that leave a, a short-term rate unchanged and move long-term? I mean, the, the intuition would be if your story is correct, uh, then uh, you should not see a lot of this Spain reaction versus alternative hypothesis that Spain economy is reacting uh, stronger to monetary policy of all sorts. It's like a more responsive economy. Other question, Philippine? I was very much interested in the, uh, all the facts that you, you showed as well, and um, I w I'm wondering, do you see any interaction between the, this um, uh, home ownership and the uh, shares of adjustable rates, as you said? Uh, the higher the share of adjustable rates, the higher the home ownership. Have we seen any changes in that since there was a move after 2015, especially in Spain, but also Italy? Uh, to um, fixed, uh, more fixed rates. Thanks, Jasper. Just a very brief technical question. When you run the regression, say, for your area and each member country, do you sort of impose? You're not imposing, I guess, that this, the sort of the, the aggregate of the individual countries sum to the euro area uh, aggregate results. Okay. You know, it would be you know it would be good to see that if you aggregate up the individual countries' impulses with the proper weights, do they come close to match your your aggregate euro area results, or is it possible that the individual country results sometimes is you know differ? If they, that thing differs significantly, you no, know, you can think maybe you're not conditioning on the right stuff for each individual country. Not uh, you know, just interesting. Thank you. The floor is yours back, Stefan. 
Okay, well, thank you so much for all the uh, questions. Try to go uh, in order. So, um, Lorenzo here. So, the um, it's so in terms of at least home ownership rates, I saw that uh, you know, looking at the series, they are very it's a across euro area countries, different euro area countries, home ownership rates are pretty sticky. So, like, they there's a lot of momentum in home ownership rates and. And, and they don't get measured at high frequency, in, in my knowledge, unfortunately. So, um, so you don't really see well over the business cycle these movements, but um, you know they're they're pretty sticky. So, so I um, I just used the snapshot in 2014 from the HFCS. That's where I measure ownership rates and adjustable rate mortgage shares, the asset finance and consumption survey. Um, so they're not state dependent in, in my model, essentially. I, uh, sorry. Um, uh, adjustable rate mortgage shares are not, not state dependent, it's just a parameter. So essentially you're saying, what if you would endogenize this and so that it would move over the business cycle? Um, I, I don't do that and you know, um, I take a stand in the paper, it would be a little bit more complicated. I take a stand and you know, this is due to institution, they don't, don't move much over the, over the business cycle. Do adjustable rate mortgage shares move more and, and you're right. Especially in, say, in Spain, we've seen a reversal uh, now there are many more fixed rate mortgages issues since 2015, given what, what was on the slide as well. Um, but I, I could think about it uh, more for sure. As of now, I, I, I don't do that So there, for adjustable mortgage shares. So, um, so Catherine, in terms of the Spain as, as an open economy, you're right. I mean, we, we don't really think of Spain as an open economy. There are uh, two things here. So first, um, you know, um, it's true. Spain is the fourth economy of the Euro area. Um, in my model, essentially, I, I show this in the calibration that there's a parameter, the unbiased parameter that determines how much an economy is open to the other. And so essentially, you have Spain is not affecting, Spain or any other country that I, can, I could calibrate do not have, does not affect the Euro area, but the other way around is true. Um, and you know, for what I'm thinking here, I'm not thinking about big shocks or a financial crisis in Spain or a housing bubble in Spain. I'm just thinking about you know moving adjustable mortgage shares over around 20 uh, points. Um, so I, I don't think that should have such a big effect in uh, to, uh, you know to the euro area. So thinking about Spain as an open economy in this context, I think it's uh, you know it's it would be fine. So. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I, I don't do QE, Giacomo, in the, in the paper. So I'm just, I have this, um, as of now, so I'm, I'm rewriting the paper and now, I, right now I have conventional policy. So I, I, I again, not doing QE. Uh, but I mean, you're right, you should see different responses because you're changing the slope of the yield curve essentially. And um, mortgages are about long rates. Although in Spain, uh, not exactly so, because you know there's a lot of uh, adjustable rate mortgages, or still a lot of uh, short rates. Um, so, um, so yes, it's something that I could think about having an extension with, with QE. As of now, I'm doing these persistent interest rate movements, uh, and, and in the new version, I'm doing just conventional policies or movement in the short rates. You still have, I mean, it's pretty remarkable. You still have, although you just shock the short rate, you still have movements in the long rates because there are these people that are, um, the savers in my model are traded the bond, so the, which is the short trade, and the mortgage. Those are the one issue in the mortgage. So there's the expectation hypothesis, and you're going to have this pass through coming fr from them. Uh, but doing you know, more specific QE would be a, a nice uh, extension to do. So thank you for the. And then uh, the question about uh, changes in adjustable rate mortgage shares and uh, home ownership rates since 2015. Uh, so it's true that, um, so I, I really don't look at that as of now. I think, you know, this, so there is the new wave of the HFCS, which I think is measured in 2020. So I could look at that. But even in the new paper, I'm really just looking at the period uh, um, till 2014, so I'm not gonna be able to say anything even empirically uh, to what happened after. Uh, my sus I, I haven't really looked at it, so my suspect is that you know, the ownership rates hasn't changed much, but maybe adjustable mortgage shares, uh, the way we were discussing them before, are changing, so I, sh I should have a look at it. Thank you. And then in terms of aggregating input response functions, um, so uh, I suspect that if, 
So as of now, I'm only doing Spain and, and the Euro area, but actually in the new version, I'm doing all countries and I'm sure improves response function for all countries. And uh, I don't have them yet, so I cannot tell you. But since I log linearize uh, the, the model, essentially, when solving it, uh, I suspect you should have uh, aggregation because I'm not considering nonlinear uh, perturbation solution. And so, so you should have uh, aggregation of the input response. So essentially, the, I have the average, which is the euro area. I have the single countries, and, and they, you know, they will aggregate exactly to the average. That, that will be my take as of now. But uh, I mean, I, I'm working on it these days, so I will get back. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Stefano, and now the last presenter of this session, Fabian. Okay. Is the mic? Yeah, no, it's on. Okay. Thanks a lot for the organizers to putting together such a nice conference and also for putting our paper into, uh, into the program. So the paper is joint work with Oliver Poiti and it's titled A Behavioral Heterogeneous Agent New Keynesian Model. And our paper is motivated by some recent empirical facts about both the transmission mechanism and also um, the effectiveness of monetary policy. First, there is more and more evidence that monetary policy, at least to a large extent, affects private consumption through, so, uh, through general equilibrium or so-called indirect effects. For example, after an expansionary monetary policy shock, the income of households increases, households spend a substantial fraction of that extra income, and this adds to the monetary transmission. Yet not all households are equally affected by monetary policy, and a statistic that has been found to be particularly important in the literature is that high marginal propensity to consume households, they tend to be more exposed to outcome for, uh, output fluctuation induced by monetary policy. And this unequal exposure of households, it tends to amplify the effectiveness of monetary policy. An announcement about future monetary policy, so-called forward guidance shocks, on the other hand, seem to have only weak effects, at least on real economic activity. And before inflation made its great comeback, um, the advanced economies, or a lot of them, have been stuck at the effective lower bound for quite some time. And we didn't see at least large instabilities arising from that. And if you look at these four facts, you will see that they are hard to square with standard macro models. If you think about a representative agent, the Keynesian model, um, it won't be consistent with any of these four facts. So what we do in the paper is we develop a new Keynesian model with household heterogeneity and a form of behavioral friction, cognitive discounting. Under cognitive discounting, households underreact to aggregate news, as can also be shown in, in, in survey data. And our behavioral heterogeneous agent New Keynesian model then, hence the title, can account for all these four facts. And importantly, it can account for them simultaneously, meaning within one version, one model calibration. Doing so, our model overcomes the tension that has been found in the Hank literature. Because Hank models that are calibrated to be uh, consistent with the first two facts, the unequal exposure and the importance of indirect effects, they tend to uh, make f uh, forward gains even more powerful compared to rational agent model, uh, re uh, representative agent model. And also, they tend to aggravate the instabilities at the effective lower bound. Our model uh, can account for all of them four simultaneously. We then show that it actually matters that our model can account for them simultaneously by revisiting um, inflationary supply shocks. So when a given supply shock hits our, uh, our model or through the lens of our model, this predicts a much stronger increase in inflation. So in inflation response is amplified in our model compared to a model without these model features. And that's actually in contrast to demand shocks, which at least persistent demand shock tends to be um, dampened in our model. So the, the prediction for supply shocks and demand shock is, is the other way around in our model. Something that I won't have time to talk about today, but I still want to flag here, is that this amplification channel of, infl of in supply shocks also suggests that there is a more pronounced trade-off between traditional targets for central bankers and side effects. What do I mean with that? Well, Given that there's this amplification channel of our inflation reacts much stronger to supply shocks, a central banker that wants to tame inflation needs to react much stronger, needs to increase the interest rate much stronger, which, however, in economies with uh, heterogeneous agents come as side effects because it changes the return on assets, which are not equally spread across households, of course. And secondly, it increases the debt, um, the debt payment or the, the debt cost of, of, of government, and so it leaves a fiscal footprint. And this fiscal footprint is, is larger in our uh, model than it is in, in, in standard models. 
Okay, I also skipped the literature in time of, uh, for the time's sake, and I will start in telling you how we write down the model. So the model consists of three blocks, and two out of these three blocks we kept deliberately stylized. So on the firm side, we employ a textbook, standard New Keynesian setup, monopolistic competition, and some nominal rigidities. And you can think about the firm side ending up in a standard New Keynesian Phillips curve. We also assume that fiscal policy simply issues bonds, which households use to self-insure, and they raise some taxes because they have debt payment on these bonds, but fiscal policy doesn't do anything else in, in, in our model. For monetary policy, we assume that monetary policy follows a rule um, subject to some monetary policy shock, both contemporaneous monetary policy shock, but it could also be, of course, forward gain shock because we always also analyze forward gains. And for the first part, I will um, assume that monetary policy directly controls the real interest rate to make um, everything a little bit more illustrative. The main innovation, however, is of course on the household side, where we um, combine this incomplete market setup in the style of Bully, Hackett, Ayagari, with this behavioral friction of cognitive discounting, and I will be now precise on how we, how we model that. Okay, there's a continuum of X under identical infinitely lived households, and they maximize the lifetime utility subject to a, a budget constraint and subject to a borrowing constraint. Now, there are two departures from the textbook model. First of all is this incomplete market setup. So each household faces an idiosyncratic risk process, which is here labeled EIT. And this idiosyncratic risk process, think about the Markov chain, which is, um, pins down the productivity of a household and therefore its labor income. And it also pins down the tax payments the household needs to do and also how much dividends the households get from the mon monopolistic competition of firms on the, on the firm's side. We actually use this function um, and calibrate it such that we can get this um, second effect into our model, which is that the correlation of the marginal propensity consumer of a household and the change in her income after a monetary policy shock, this correlation is positive in our model. And there's actually like an, a recent estimate in a recent AER paper by Patterson, which estimates uh, exactly this correlation and we target this, this, um, this correlation which, which she finds. The second departure is that the expectation here is not derived uh, ration, uh, rationally, but boundedly rational in the following sense. We assume here this cognitive discounting setup, which has been proposed by Gabet in a representative Asian framework, and we extend it now to a, to a economy with a heterogeneous household. So the idea is that the expectation of a future value of some variable x or a vector of variable x we first break it down into an anchor value, x bar, that a household might have in mind, plus a deviation around that anchor value. And if we then employ this expectation operator, it will be the anchor value itself, plus m bar, which is a parameter, times the rational expectation of that deviation. The first thing to note here is that if m bar is 1, we are back in the, uh, in the rational age, uh, in the rational, fully rational world. So this is a, we can always compare our model to the rational counterpart of the model by simply setting m bar to one. If m bar is, however, below one, this implies that households cognitively discount expected deviations. There is some form of myopia, or as can be seen in the survey data, households underreact to aggregate news. The anchor value that the households have in, 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 in our economy is the stationary equilibrium outcome of that variable. For example, if that variable x is, um, is wages, that's simply the steady state wage, but this variable x might also be a marginal utility that the households have in mind to have in some idiosyncratic state that she might be tomorrow in, then the anchor value for that is the marginal utility that she has in that state in stationary equilibrium. This implies that absent aggregate shocks, everybody is fully rational in our economy. Households fully understand the Markov process, which drives the idiosyncratic risk. But as soon as an aggregate shock hits the economy, pushes the economy out of stationary equilibrium, households anchor their expectation to stationary equilibrium. We also do um, an extension later on where we also assume that households underreact or overreact with respect to the idiosyncratic risk, and it doesn't change our, our results. Okay, how can we discipline this parameter? Well, as I said, you can, you, can, um, you can look at survey data and there you will find that households underreact to aggregate news and then you can compute it back to this M bar parameter. And these empirical estimates, they somewhere are in between 0 0.6 and 0 0.85. And um, for most of what I'm gonna show you, we keep the parameter 0 0.85 as a conservative choice at this, the upper bound of the empirical estimates. Okay. 
Given these two new um, departures from the textbook uh, model, what does this imply for monetary policy? How does monetary policy work in our model? How can we reconcile the model with fact one to three? I won't talk about the effective lower bound today for time reason, but about for facts one till three. And I will do so in two ways. First, I will show you a very stylized version of our model in which we um, essentially there will only be limited heterogeneity. Why? Because we can then derive an analytical IS equation and so we can, uh, we can um, learn from the IS equation how these two model features, how they interact with each other, where do they enter the model. Secondly, I will then also show you the results for the full model where there's a full-blown heterogeneity, there's a um, household heterogeneity who have different wealth and, and so on and so forth. Let us start with the simple model. So the idea here is that we reduce the idiosyncratic risk process to only having two states and we assume that the government does not issue any debt. So there's no outside uh, asset supply in the economy and so in equilibrium, no household can save. So this is kind of a zero liquidity economy. You can think about that model or the, the heterogeneity part of the model as being a two agent model but they are still type switching. So agents still switch between the one and the other type. So there's still this precautionary savings motive that households have in, in, in hang models. And when we then derive the IS equation, you will see that the IS equation looks kind of familiar, but for two innovations showing up in the form of two new coefficients. The first one being in front of the expected output uh, tomorrow. And the second is the con uh, in front of the real interest rate today. And the first thing to note here is that the, um, the coefficient, uh, the contemporaneous coefficient in front of the real interest rate today, it only de depends on coefficients that come from the household heterogeneity setup. This lambda is the share of hand to mouse households. This chi is the exposure of the hand to mouse households to uh, fluctuations in, in, in output. And cognitive discounting does not enter that uh, coefficient. Yet in the forward-looking coefficient, it um, depends on the interaction between the cognitive discounting parameter, M bar, and stuff that comes again from the household heterogeneity setup, basically which de describes the dynamics of the precautionary savings motive of households. And in, when you compare it to a rank model, in rank these two coefficients would simply be one, so we can compare our model to, to the rank model. We can also compare it to the rational version of that, an analytical rational hang model, and I will do so on the next Next slide, when I look at the implication of that new IS equation for conventional monetary policy shocks, but also for forward guidance shocks. And actually, I will start with the rank model, and what I'm going to plot here is not an impulse response function, but it will be a set of monetary policy experiments. So the idea is always uh, the following. Today, monetary policy announces that it will decrease the real interest rate for one period at some horizon in the future. So on the x-axis, the zero means a contemporaneous monetary policy shock, a decrease in the real interest rate today, and then it jumps back to steady state and stays at steady state for all time. Five implies that today's monetary policy announces to decrease the real interest rate in five periods from now, so it's forward guidance shock. On the y-axis is always the effect that this has on today's output. And a well-known result in the rank of the rank model is that this is a flat line. So um, the effectiveness of the forward guidance shock on today's output does not depend on its horizon. So no matter whether the real interest rate is decreased today or in five quarters from now, it always has the same effect. And people have found this puzzling and have dubbed this the forward guidance puzzle. And the reason is that in the IS equation, there is no discounting because its IF parameter is one. A second um, shortcoming of this model when it comes to monetary policy transmission is that all of this is due to intertemporal substitution. So direct effects play the large role of, of, of the monetary policy transmission where there's no role by basically for indirect effect in, in, in that model. If you look at the rational version of our model, the rational hang model, you will see that now indirect effects play a huge role in the monetary policy transmission. That has been a major theme of, if you think about Kaplan, Moll, and Violanda's paper, major theme of this early hang literature. In our model, these indirect effects, they are particularly strong. Why? Because a monetary policy shock, ceteris barbaros, redistributes towards high marginal propensity to consume households, which was fact two, and they spend a lot of their extra income, thereby um, making this, pushing up the, um, the, the strengths of the indirect effects and also thereby pushing up the overall effectiveness of contemporaneous monetary policy. What you can, however, see is that in that model, the forward guidance puzzle is actually aggravated compared to the rank model. 
Why is that the case? Well, when households expect a future boom, because there has been a forward guidance announcement, households expect a boom in the future, they know that in the high marginal propensity consumed state, when they end up being hand to mouth, they are actually relatively better off. And since they precautionary save against exactly that state, they cut back on their precautionary savings already today, which pushes up the effectiveness of the forward guidance shock today. And this becomes, if you go further in the, in the, on the horizon, this becomes a really, really large. This is, however, not the case in our model. In our model, when there is also cognitive discounting, households both cognitively discount that there will be a decrease in the real interest rate in the future, and they also cognitively discount what this implies for their precautionary savings motif. And both of these effective, uh, effects pushes down this psi f parameter, and for all reasonable um, calibrations, this is below one, so there is actually discounting in the Euler equation. At the same time, and our model still indirect effects play this important role in the monetary policy transmission because still monetary policy, contemporaneous monetary policy, redistributes towards high marginal propensity to consume households and therefore these indirect effects, they are very important in, in our model. And so our model can be consistent with this, these two effects, um, for no forward guidance puzzle, and um, there is this um, major role for indirect effects in the monetary transmission. Now you might say that, okay, this has been basically a two-agent model. There's not really a hang model. Do we only get the results because we, we use this simplified version of the model? So what we also do in the paper is we use a more standard calibration where there's a lot of idiosyncratic states and where there's an actual wealth distribution and which we need to keep track of and which we need to then solve and, uh, numerically. And you see now, this is the, the result for our full model, for our full behavioral hang model, and you see that on the blue dash line, that's again our behavioral hang model, you see that again, there's no forward guidance puzzle, the importance of indirect effects pushes up the effectiveness of contemporaneous monetary policy, whereas the full rational hang model still suffers from these forward guidance puzzles. So it also holds in the, in the full model our results. So departing from this full model, in the paper we do then a lot of extension, which I don't have time to talk about in detail today. For example, we look at heterogeneity in this behavioral friction, because we find some evidence that there is some heterogeneity in this behavioral friction. As I already said, we look at over and also underreaction with respect to idiosyncratic risk. There's some evidence for overreaction with respect to idiosyncratic risk. We look at sticky wages and stack of sticky prices, and we look at different calibrations of this unequal exposure. Um, and the results basically they go through with all of these extension or, or model changes. So given now that we have a model which is consistent with these four facts about monetary, the monetary transmission, we then use the model to revisit um, inflationary supply shock because we all know we are ended now a world where there's a lot of inflation. And the idea here is that what I'm showing you today here is it's a simple TFP shock. So think about as total factor productivity, which follows an AR1 process with some persistency. And um, it, TFP decreases such that potential output drops by 1% on impact. Now monetary follow policy follows a simple Taylor rule with a standard feedback coefficient. And I again compare our model to these, uh, these other models, and I start with the rank model, so as typical, the nominal interest rate increases because the central bank leans against this supply shock. Therefore, output falls, but output falls by less than potential output, so there's a positive output gap. Uh, the economy is overheating, and there is inflation. In the rational version of our model, this is a little bit amplified. And the reason here is simply because the positive output gap redistributes towards high marginal propensity to consume households. A positive output gap can also be interpreted as a too loose monetary policy. R is below R star, so there's kind of expansionary monetary policy. Expansionary monetary policy redistributes towards high marginal propensity to consume households. This ceteris paribus dampens the fall in output and therefore output rate increases by a little more, and therefore there's also a little bit higher inflation. In our behavioral hang model, this is m even much more amplified. And the reason it is now there's a second channel going in exactly the same direction. What is that? Well, if you look at the nominal interest rate, again, you see that they are increased, and also the real rate is increased for quite some time. And rational households, they fully understand that. They understand as soon as they see, this, see the supply shock that uh, real interest rate will stay up for quite some time. And these expectations brings them or um, incentivize them to cut back further on consumption already today. So rational in a rational household will cut back their, their consumption already drastically today simply by the expectations of higher interest rates. 
This is not so much the case in our model because now households cognitive discount these expectations or these higher interest rates in the future and therefore the output gap increases by even more, redistribution even further towards high marginal propensity consume households and so on and so forth until the economy ends up in an equilibrium where inflation is almost two and a half times as strong as it would be in the representative agent model. We can do a little bit composition of where this extra amplification comes from. The part that comes from the unequal exposure of households, the part that comes from the discounting, and the part that comes from the interaction of these two model features. And the last thing I want to show you is that, remember that I set the M bar to the upper, uh, upper um, bound of the empirical estimates, the 0 0.85. What if, however, we go to the lower empirical estimates at the lower bound of the empirical gets 0 0.6, and you see that now the, in, the amplification gets even stronger, so it's now almost three and a half times, or more than three and a half times as much as it would be in the rank model, and now the interaction really uh, takes a leading role in this amplification channel. Okay, I'm out of time, let me quickly conclude. And what we do in the paper is we develop this new Keynesian model with household heterogeneity and this behavioral friction in the form of cognitive discounting. We then show that our model can simultaneously account for these four empirical facts that I've talked about, um, about the transmission of monetary policy. And we then show that it has implications for um, inflationary supply shocks because it amplifies inflationary supply shocks. And in the paper, we then also show that it suggests a more pronounced trade-off between price stability and distributional consequences. And I'm out of time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. Uh, open, open the floor for questions for this paper. Any question? Yeah. A, a clarification. You have a cognitive discounting only on households and not on firms. Now, suppose that something like that would apply also to firms. Does it mean that uh, the new Keynesian Phillips curve We'll have this discounting uh, on expectations. And so also the amplification of uh, inflationary shocks might be put in perspective of who is uh, discounting. Right. Other questions? Wolfgang? Yeah, that looks very interesting, also um, very relevant regarding the forward guidance puzzle. I'm not an expert in these type of models, just maybe you can clarify also for others like, like me. Um, does household heterogeneity uh, um, show up in the welfare and the uh, of um, of the um, of the of the aggregate welfare? Uh, and then related, how would monetary policy optimally uh, behave in such a model? Because you had the simple Taylor rule, and that was quite clear the results. But what would happen if the monetary policy would do the best that can? Thank you. Cutting. Very stupid question, since you uh, alluded to side effects on fiscal policy and distribution. Can you say a few words on that? David? Thank you. Uh, very interesting paper. Congratulations as well. Uh, so, uh, again, it's a similar question. Uh, I think it's very intuitive what's going on in the model. Uh, what I'm interested in is, what's your view on how do you identify this uh, cognitive discounting? What, what, how do you pin down the value of M? What, what's, the, what's the statistic that you're looking in the data? What kind of expectations you're using? Uh, because you're not presumably not looking at inflation data. You, you're looking at output uh, forecasts to pin it down. And how do you figure that out? Thanks. OK. Probably floor back to you, Fabian. Okay, thanks. Let me start in reverse. Um, so we pin it down, basically. Um, we look at the Michigan Consumer Service and we pin down about unemployment expectations and inflation expectations. In both this kind, we find that there is like, um, whenever households revise their, um, revise their forecast, we can find that this predicts actually a forecast error in the future. And this means that households, when they, knew, when they learn about news, they don't go all the way in revising their forecast already. And that's why this predicts a forecast error in the, in the future. And, but there's also, we are not, not the first one who did that or would document this underreaction of, of, um, towards aggregate news. There's also other uh, people in the literature that have done that and they come to similar, similar results and also similar ballparks of, of where the parameters should be. Hmm? 
But ju just to clarify, you're looking at the sort of Coivion or Onichenko regression? Exactly. So? Okay. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, then there was a question about fiscal policy and distribution. Um, so was it referring to the, what I showed last to this after the supply shock? Okay, so the idea here is, um, so in the paper we actually, we also look at the case in which monetary policy can prevent inflation from happening after such a supply shock. So there is kind of a divine coincidence if, if you want. And in that case, however, interest rates need to increase much more forcefully than it does in a representative agent model or also in the rational Hank model. And this comes with some side effects because an increase in the real interest rate, it changes the, the, um, the, the return on assets, which has then uh, distributional consequences. And at the same time, as the, governor, uh, the government issues the debt and has interest rate payments, it also changes the interest rate payments. So debt increases much more strongly in our model compared to in a, in a rational Hank model where uh, debt increases by much less. And this could be some, um, some considerations that monetary policy might need to take into consideration from a normative perspective. That goes then back also to the welfare question. So um, the household heat tonight would enter the welfare function. We don't have a welfare, the social welfare function in the model. We just positively sh um, show that there is this uh, pronounced trade-off and it is pronounced, this trade-off is very pronounced in our model. Now, if you want to do optimal policy, we would first of all need to take a stance of is the steady state optimally? Is the steady state efficient? And is the distribution that we have in steady state, is this optimally? What we can say is that given, assuming that that would be optimally, a change in the real interest rate that is even stronger now than compared to other models would play around with this distribution even further and so would push it even further from its optimal steady state level. And the same is maybe true as the interaction with fiscal policy because given that it increases the debt level or leaves a fiscal footprint, fiscal policy at some point needs to raise its taxes and therefore deviate from maybe the optimal steady state uh, tax level. But um, we haven't done it fully, the, 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 um, the optimal fiscal policy, uh, optimal monetary policy in that model, but that would be something interesting to um, going f further. Um, welfare and optimality, and then was something about, about the firms. Yeah, the, um, we have an extension where we also assume um, firms to be behavioral. Um, we kept it out of the main part of the paper because we wanted to focus on the household side and how these two frictions interact on the household side. We have done it also for this in um, supply um, for the supply shock, and then it would dampen the inflation a little bit. It would also change a little bit the um, the trade-off between output, not output gap, but output itself and and inflation. And but still, inflation would increase stronger than in a representative agent in the Keynes model. But it would counteract this this force. Just, just one clarification. When, when, when you discuss the amplification results, it's, it's clear from the input responses that the Taylor rule is suboptimal. It's a pretty bad policy because you create a positive output gap and inflation is going up. You want to just actually close the output gap. What, what is also very clear is because you have this cognitive uh, approach to rational expectation, the Taylor rule with this principle, 1.5 that you're using, with this value that you're using, is even more suboptimal. So you might want to just have a discussion on how changes in that parameter, in that policy parameter, is actually affecting the amplification that you're trying to emphasize. Because in Gabay's paper, he shows that the Taylor principle depends on this M parameter that you have. So you might want to introduce some discussion to just emphasize that the amplification that you're getting is, is conditional on certain rules, mm -hmm. in particular the rule that you're using that is clearly suboptimal. Mm -hmm. That could help. Yeah, that, that's true. And um, actually, if we would push the Taylor coefficients to, let's say, infinity or close to infinity, then we would close the uh, inflation output get fully. But then we get these this large side effects coming from, because the real interest rate still needs to react much stronger than it needs in right. standard models. Yeah, that's correct. OK, thanks a lot. Then uh, let me again, uh, thanks Anastasia, Stefano, and uh, Fabian for the great presentation uh, on behalf actually of the entire organizing committee. We wish a great success for your respective paper. Um, hopefully, they will be published in a very good journal. And um, again, thank you for having joined us today.